Hi everybody, I'm Addison Snell with Intersect 360 Research. We're analysts who cover the high performance computing space and also a big focus of my presentation today, uh, the hyperscale market, which we uh, used to cover as part of HPC, but has really evolved to where it's a distinct market on its, on its own. Uh, we had a great time in the panel Yesterday, talking about exascale, I enjoy that, that style of uh, panel. And for those of you who like to see more of that sort of thing, I will actually have Galad on my uh, analyst crossfire panel coming up at ISC this June. So I think that was the real reason he wanted me to moderate yesterday, was to give him a warm-up and uh, see what, what kind of questions I might ask him when I get him in the hot seat uh, in a couple of months. Ad -lib. All right, I can ad lib. That's fine. Um, Intersect 360 research, I mentioned we're analysts in the HPC space. That means we do the things that analysts do, market sizing, forecasting, trend analysis. We run lots and lots of surveys. Uh, we uh, show up at conferences like this one. We're thrilled to continue to partner with the HPC Advisory Council. I think this is an excellent end user conference series and we've been supporting as many of them as we can. I think if not me, others of my colleagues have been at every one of them we've had over the last two, three years, except the ones in China, and that's not because we don't like China, it's because they're right before supercomputing, and it's just hard for, for us to split out an analyst when we're trying to get everything ready for our clients right then. Uh, but uh, we look forward to continuing to participate in as many of these as possible. Um, my talk today, we're going to look at um, not only HPC and hyperscale, but some of the trends uh, from SC15. If any of you were at the Stanford event a few weeks ago, I'm going to do something I usually don't do, which is I'm going to repeat my talk from that. So if you were at Stanford and you totally got everything that I said then and you want to go get a cup of coffee, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to do the same talk again because this is a really important um, uh, presentation for us in terms of methodologically how we're setting up looking at the market a little different in 2016 from where it's been. Starting with a um, baseline on the market uh, in terms of uh, where it stands, the high performance computing market was about $30 billion, just underneath that worldwide in 2014. Now, why 2014, not 2015, is because we haven't finished the 2015 actuals yet. You have to wait for all the vendors to close their books and report, which generally doesn't happen until about now. So my partner, Chris Willard, our chief research officer, is now buried in things like annual reports, and he's talking to vendors uh, meanwhile, Laura Siegerval has been going through all of our end user um, uh, budget expectation data in order to help build the market model. We usually come out with a new market model and forecast around April or May every year, so we're sort of just before that. Um, I think basically we're pretty close to what we've been forecasting in terms of uh, modest growth, still being driven primarily in the commercial segments. The one exception um, is, well, we haven't had the meeting where we get together and fight about it all day yet among our team, but I would say pretty definitively the oil and gas segment is going to be missing what we originally forecast from the year before because we, we didn't forecast the price of oil going down to you know, $30 a barrel, right? So uh, that's kind of beyond the scope of our forecast, and that'll cause that segment to miss. But overall, we're going to be pretty close to what we've been forecasting. Um, and that's uh, still looking at this low fours compound annual growth, and, and we should be out in this mid-30s billions of dollars by 2019, and of course we'll extend the forecast out now another year to 2020. We will have significant changes in the uh, vendor shares. Um, in 2014, we had IBM selling off its x86 server business to Lenovo. That reshuffled a lot of things uh, considerably. Cray has been gaining considerably. HP has been gaining considerably. Um, Dell was actually the number one server vendor by revenue in 2014, uh, just barely ahead of HP by you know the amount of money you carry around in your pocket. So it was an insignificant amount unless you happen to be in Dell PR, in which case it's a very significant amount because you get to claim that you were number one. Um, I. Th <laughs> 
it's we can't definitively say until we finish 2015 who's number one versus number two but I will say that just using the demand side indicators what we get back in our surveys from end users it looks like HP had a better year than Dell had and uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if we saw those flipped and HP was number one in, in 2015 yes So the question was, how would we know the, the actual vendor shares if the vendors don't report anymore? Um, this is actually a problem even before Dell went private, because you take HP, who's not private, or IBM, uh, high performance computing is not at the business unit level. So they don't have a separate HPC line in the annual report, which means that according to Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, they actually can't tell us anything. It becomes actually illegal for them to give us any kind of guidance on what their HPC business did. So um, Chris, from the supply side, starts by looking at the business unit level and tracking you know, at the enterprise level is the business up or down and looking for any indicators as to whether the mix of high performance computing within a given group is going up or down. Then we rely very heavily on a lot of end user surveys because we can get a good sense from uh, our, our site census uh, survey whether the individual vendor shares are going up or down and in which segments. Then the rest is models and analyst opinion. Uh, we do the best we can. Um, we feel like we've got the best models out there of vendor revenue, but the idea that you can just get a quarterly number from the vendor, put it in a spreadsheet and say, here are the shares, that doesn't exist in high performance computing. I, it's a great model when it works, right? If we were tracking smartphones, we just call the manufacturers of smartphones and say, can you fill this out for us and say how many units, how much revenue, and then we'll put it into a spreadsheet and sell it back to you for $60,000 a year. That's great. That's how most analyst businesses work. Um, it, it doesn't, unfortunately, work that way in high-performance computing. You have to do a lot, of, a lot more work to, to dig at what the real vendor shares are. Um, it's worth saying, uh, you know, since you asked, that our view of vendor shares has been very different from IDCs in this space. Going back the last several years, we had IBM as a clear number one, and HP and Dell were, were kind of duking it back and forth for number two in, a, in any given year. IDC had HP and IBM kind of tied for number one back and forth, and then Dell way behind in number three. Um, you can ask them about their methodology. We couldn't find enough HP users in any of our surveys to, to justify that, especially given that, and I'll get to some of these slides, we count a lot of business computing vertical markets where HP is strong that IDC doesn't count in their survey. So that kind of makes it a bigger disconnect. I don't get where they were finding their, their HP revenue. Um, but that's a question for IDC. Um, this is actually right to this point, what we count as HPC in the market. Um, there's, you know, the easiest thing that people think of first is this green segment, which is public high performance technical computing. So this is your uh, government and academic spending in HPC, most of which is research. Some of it is in production in national defense in any country, that's government also. But those are the first things people think of. And then if you push them, people will pretty quickly think of this red segment, which is commercial high performance technical computing. This will be science and engineering applications that are still being done at a for-profit company. So manufacturing and pharmaceuticals and oil and gas. There are any number of for-profit companies that do science and engineering, either in production or in research. Where it gets different is in how much we count this high performance business computing area, which is non-scientific business applications for HPC. Finance is our largest segment here. We see a lot of high performance computing and always have seen it in areas like, well, uh, trading is the one that everyone talks about. If you go to the high performance computing on Wall Street event that comes up uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, trading is the application that people will talk about the most. It's kind of the easiest one for everyone to get their heads around. To me, it's actually almost boring to keep talking about because there's not a lot to say after you get the idea of, okay, latency's not zero yet, and if I could get it to be below zero, that'd be even better. 
you know, that's, but then that's kind of it. I want it to go faster, and they're not going to tell you what their algorithm is, so I'm kind of done talking about it. It's not that there isn't a lot of money there or that it isn't important. It is. To me, the more fascinating area is actually everything that goes on in risk management, which they don't like to talk about at all. But that's the larger, more complicated, faster-growing, more heavily regulated area. Uh, and, and there's a lot that goes on with the Monte Carlo simulations uh, and the... Uh, uh, and their own in-house uh, applications for how they uh, uh, mitigate risk in, uh, in investment banking, in uh, securities, uh, credit cards, you name it. They all have risk management uh, kinds of applications. So we see finances being quite large, um, enter, you know, entertainment, logistics, retail, there are all kinds of those segments. Uh, I do have one chart that does compare what we do and don't count for, between us and IDC. If you just had that green public sector area, uh, and we're, I'm doing my best to map their verticals to our verticals. Ours tend to be vertical, and theirs tend to be a little more application-centric. Like CAE is a type of application. I'm mapping that to, uh, to, uh, to, to manuf manufacturing. Uh, segments for the most part, but in theory, someone who's not a manufacturer could do CAE. Um, if you look at just these high-performance technical computing areas, they tend to count the market a little bigger than we do, but we count it as larger overall because we're counting some of these segments here that aren't part of their methodology. And even within this, they've got digital content creation and distribution as being significantly larger than we're counting media and entertainment. The difference is that they had uh, finance as being almost nothing. They have it as the eighth largest commercial vertical market, and we have it as the largest commercial vertical market. We see it as a big disconnect there. Now, I'm, since I gave this presentation at Stanford a few weeks ago, I'm given to understand someone told me that IDC is redoing this and now following us by making finance much larger. I don't know if that means they're adding money to the market overall or if they're taking it out of the other vertical markets and putting it into finance. Again, you can ask IDC, but as of the last public numbers that we could compare, that was a big difference in how we view the market. It's about the same overall, but we see it as uh, a bigger business segment than they saw it. Um, now, as far as the forecast goes, this is my favorite quote that my partner, Chris Willard, has ever said. When you do a forecast, it has to be bound by what's realistic, but reality does not have to do that, right? And that's why when you do a forecast, you get things that tend to go up smoothly because you don't forecast things like wars or the price of oil you know, fluctuating wildly. You're forecasting computing, assuming relatively steady underlying macroeconomic conditions. And then what actually happens is things get bouncy, right? You have things like recessions and, uh, and, and, uh, and surges that, that you didn't forecast. So, you know, overall we're seeing the market is going up and to the right at a modest rate of, of about 4%. The servers are, act, are still the largest component uh, but they're actually the slowest growing component here. Um, the other areas like, uh, like uh, software and storage are growing faster than, um, than, uh, than servers. Although actually software, this purple, was maybe actually not the right one for me to have picked because the growth rate in software is maybe not as high as you would think. For the people who are using ISV software, they're spending more and more, and the, the revenue goes up considerably. But that's, that's been offset by an industry-wide trend to integrate more in-house and open source software. And that's been uh, taking the air out of a lot of the growth in actual software revenue. So if you're an ISV, the trend has been that you're making more money from fewer customers. Right, uh, uh, who, who haven't migrated yet. But if you look at the underlying trend about where software is going right now, there's a lot more in-house and open source than there was five years ago. Open Foam, as an example, has been the fastest growing application that we've been tracking uh, pretty much every year for the last five years. Um, Fluent has gone from having about 95% share of the CFD market to having about 50% share of the CFD market. 
open foam is the largest thing that's taken it away, but also a lot of it has gone to in-house, people who, who just write their own CFD to take it back away from Fluent. Um, now, market share is a funny con concept there, because if you, if you measure it by revenue, it's still 95% you know, on Fluent, right? And that's what most people usually talk about with market share, but market share gets funny when you talk about software, because what you're really trying to measure is percent of usage or workflow or you know how much mind share does it have and and that's where we've really seen the change um, cloud I'll mention briefly uh, since I'm on this chart and I don't have it elsewhere in my presentation we do see us kind of right now at, at an elbow where it's starting to grow faster we've been projecting growth in cloud in kind of the mid-teens about a 14 15 percent compound annual growth rate but that's coming from a very small basis. Cloud is still only about 2% of the, of the overall HPC market. We have this very well triangulated from multiple studies. Um, what, what we do see is more people have tried incorporating cloud as part of their overall workload. If you ask what percent of HPC users do some cloud, it's about 35%. But that doesn't mean that cloud has a 35% market share because the reality is of the people who do cloud, mostly they do it for about 5% of their workload. So 5% of 35% is about 1.7, right? So that's where you get that 2% that of the market. And, and again, that's pretty well triangulated from multiple places. We do think that'll start going up. Um, our latest budget map data that came in in our most recent survey actually did not find this growth. We're going to have to ratchet this down and push the growth out. Um, it, it stayed steady on the budget side. So we're forecasting growth. We thought it would start in 2015. It did not start in 2015. We still think it will start. We're going to take that growth and we're going to push it out to 2016 if I have anything to say about it. And it's my company, so I probably do. Um, I mentioned the, the, uh, the server shares. Again, this is 2014. We haven't redone this for 2015, but I put it up because it will change a lot. That's because IBM has a big green chunk here that still contained three quarters worth of the x86 business before the Lenovo deal closed. Uh, that closed at the end of the third quarter of 2014. So there's still, yeah, IBM won't go to zero, right? IBM's still a vendor in this space and they have non x86 stuff that they sell. So they'll still be uh, a vendor here, but a lot of that will go to Dell and HP and, and other companies that are, that are in this big purple wedge here. Um, I, I think it'll wind up being HP will be one, Dell will be two, um, IBM probably, uh, well, sorry, Lenovo will be three, and then IBM versus Cray will be close for number four. We're going to have to really look at the numbers there to see did IBM fall off enough and did Cray gain enough that Cray catches up to IBM. I, it's probably still IBM, but let us finish the, the numbers first. The reason that um, the Dell and HP are so close when a strictly supply side view of that would have had them farther away from each other is that if you ask Dell and HP about their businesses in HPC um, traditionally over the last few years, Dell would have used a narrower definition of HPC than HP would have used. HP would count all of those business areas that we were talking about and Dell wouldn't. So HP says, oh yeah, it's really big, and Dell says, oh, it's not that big. But if you measure them with the same yardstick, it starts evening out, right? And, and that's where our survey data has really helped us in saying, gosh, there's a lot of Dell systems out there that Dell doesn't even know they have that are part of the HPC market. Okay, um, getting to the main thrust of my presentation today and talking about uh, trends from supercomputing, the biggest thing is the hyperscale market. If I go back to some of these forecast areas that I had here, uh, where was it, the vertical markets in high-performance business computing, we actually used to have this larger because we were counting a, uh, a segment we called ultrascale internet and we've been counting ultrascale internet since 2007. Intersect 360 Research is actually now in its 10th year. 
uh, as an analyst business. So, um, you know, a, a decade for us is actually kind of a big deal. We've been around for a few generations of this now. But even in 2007, it was clear that companies like Google were acquiring and investing in high-performance technologies. I mean, you had Steve Scott working there. They bought a company called Peakstream that did stream processors. And here, here we're tracking this little st uh, stream processing company as part of the HPC market. Then Google absorbed it, and you never heard from them again. That's a pretty good clue that there was HPC going on at Google even a decade ago. Um, and and we were we had a, a pretty good estimate for it, although I, I think we fell behind on it. It was growing faster than we were giving it credit for. And we've now taken this segment out of HPC because at this point, nine years later, it's grown and evolved to the point where hyperscale is not really part of HPC anymore. It is a proximity market that has some similarities to HPC that are important, and we're but it also has some important differences that distinguish it from HPC. So Intersect 360 Research, beginning this year, is tracking hyperscale as a distinct segment from HPC. We've gone back and taken it out of all of our old numbers so that we can set it up as a separate market that we're tracking. Um, what that looks like here, the similarities and differences, starting with the things that it has the same. Um, the first one is the most important one here, is that the application infrastructure is distinct from your general enterprise infrastructure, right? That when I buy a system for HPC, that's generally a distinct infrastructure from my enterprise computing that's running my overall business, my, my email server, my website, my payroll database, my ERP, all that other stuff that falls under the umbrella of enterprise computing, the stuff that I invest in to run my day-to-day -day business, is generally not the same infrastructure where I'm running my computational fluid dynamics or my CAE or my risk management, even in finance. It's very rare to find a company, even at the entry level, where that's the same infrastructure. Uh, and I'm running a, an HPC job on my enterprise infrastructure. This is different, by the way, from big data. Big data largely is run, a big data applications largely are run on the inter enterprise infrastructure I already have, which is why it's hazardous for analysts to start saying the big data market is umpty ump billion dollars and growing at such and such a rate. Because A, you haven't told me yet what is one big data and how much does it cost. Right? How many big datas are there in your forecast? And if you say, well, I'm counting all of this server infrastructure and storage infrastructure that people are buying, well, you're, no, you're not, because they already bought that. Okay, You're double counting everything. So you have to be really careful with that methodology. HPC, you have a separate infrastructure that's relatively easy to separate out and say, all right, I'm counting these systems that are running these applications. Hyperscale has that same characteristic where if you're at a company like Yahoo, you've got your, your, your systems that you use to run your everyday business, and you've got your systems that you use to serve out your hyperscale applications, and those are two different things. So with hyperscale, I kind of skipped the definition on the previous slide, we're talking about um, uh, the infrastructure that runs web scale applications and that being distinct from uh, this, uh, this general enterprise infrastructure. So if you look at Google and Yahoo and eBay and Amazon and uh, Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba, there's this tier one that's really easy to identify at the top. Uh, but then they influence a broad market of hundreds of users below that who have web scale application infrastructures, maybe not at the scale of a Google, but they're still arbitrarily scalable, which is the second important point here that's similar to HPC, which is to say there's not, in a sense, a maximum scale that a job gets run at. Sending an email is not arbitrarily scalable, really. I mean, there's, a, there's an idea of how big email is or serving out a web page. But, but uh, HPC can be done at an arbitrary level of scale in the idea that you can always add more degrees of freedom or refine your mesh or add in more data, more realism. 
into your model. Until one day we wake up and say we've reached the end of science, hooray, we're done, there's always going to be a hard, harder problem to solve, right? That's kind of the cool thing about HPC. And hyperscale has that in the sense that as the internet gets essentially larger, all of these applications also get essentially larger with the idea that there isn't a theoretical maximum of how big something like search can get, right? They can be done at these arbitrary levels of scalability. And then thirdly, these top tier users will push boundaries and influence technology throughout the industry. The idea that you have a supercomputer layer at the top where you're pushing the boundary of innovation and then those technologies and innovations work their way through. That happens in hyperscale also, particularly in software. And this is again where the, the similarity continues, that you'll have software innovations at the top of the industry that then percolate down. In, in hyperscale you see that most notably with OpenStack, but also with new application areas like machine learning, right, or cognitive computing or deep neural networks or whatever you want to put all of that artificial intelligence underneath, that you see the top uh, uh, users, the Baidus, the Googles, the Facebooks, Microsofts, uh, pushing the boundaries in this and then having an influence down through the rest of the market. Is this making sense so far? Because this is like really important to me that this starts holding together because this is a big part of what we're doing this year. Okay, so then, but then there's differences, right? In HPC, the primary focus has always been on some metric of performance, uh, price performance, performance per price, really. How fast can I run the job? And in hyperscale, the primary focus isn't on performance, it's on scalability, which is similar but different. And it has to do with the fact that HPC tends to be large jobs where large is a relative idea, but the idea is that I have one job that spans multiple nodes. Even if I'm on an eight node cluster, there's the idea that that's a big job for that cluster and I'm going to use all of the resources of that cluster. Whereas hyperscale tends to be about many jobs. How many people can I serve at once? It's not that any individual job tends to be that big, but it's just that I have to do so many of them. And that's also related to this third point, is that HPC is still HPC at an entry level of scale. I could be doing a genomics application on a couple of nodes, and it's relatively easy for me to look at that and say, all right, you've got a four-node cluster, but you're doing... Uh, technical computing, you're part of the HPC market. Hyperscale does not have that entry level of the market. You fall below a certain level and it just becomes enterprise computing. The website for Intersect 360 Research has a search function. It doesn't work very well. It needs to be fixed, okay? But the search function on my website is not hyperscale. It's just part of my enterprise infrastructure. But you reach some level of scale where you're building out something different in order to do that, and it starts becoming hyperscale. And then you can start looking for you know, what are the companies, what are the infrastructures that are right on the boundary of that, right? It's easy to, to start counting the tier one ones, but where do you put um, something like Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia is a different, uh, essentially a search you know, algorithm. Uh, it is arbitrarily scalable. It does have a distinct application infrastructure. Is that just enterprise computing, or do they tip over into the hyperscale? As we start laying out our methodologies for this, they tend to fit into, yes, we do want to count that, but they're in that lower tier of the market. So you get into things like, all right, well, then what about... Etsy, right? Is Etsy just uh, enterprise computing and web, you know, and web, or, or do they have a hyperscale application? You have to start eventually drawing a line and saying what's in, what's out. Um, and then finally, at the opposite end of the scale, whoops, is uh, there's there's still there's also a difference there in that the largest supercomputers in the HPC market tend to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. That's a pretty big supercomputer. You can get multiple hundreds of millions. The largest hyperscale installations are ten times that size. They're over a billion dollars. Um, where I talk about this tier one, we get into this next chart. If we get into the tier one of hyperscale. We could list the top 15 hyperscale companies, and on average, they would spend over a billion dollars a year. Over a billion dollars a year on IT each. And the top ones are spending four or five billion dollars a year. Um, that's, you see individual RFPs for a billion dollars. 
uh, it, that top level of scale is different in hyperscale than it is in HPC, and that's why it has so much influence on the market. But below that, we're crafting out uh, different tiers of the market. This is a draft, by the way, from a report that we're going to have coming out to our clients. This will be our first report on hyperscale any day now. Uh, we're really spending a lot of time internally fighting over a lot of the wording on this report because when you do a research methodology, you'd kind of like to not have to revise it later and think everything through. Um, this is a draft from that. Since I made this slide, we're actually crafting the wording around another segment, not really another tier, but an orthogonal tier to go next to tier two and tier three, which is for hyperscale infrastructure, well, application infrastructure that's the size of a tier two or a tier three, but they're not buying their own infrastructure. They're actually running it on the cloud infrastructure from a tier one. So if I have, you know, if it turned out that, uh, that Wikipedia is actually using all Amazon resources and none of its own, then you'd actually put that into that orthogonal tier that I don't even know what we want to call it. We're playing with words for it, a service tier of some kind. If you think of what that tier ought to be called, tell me what it should be called because you want to count it as the idea of a hyperscale customer but in actuality, they're not adding any incremental revenue because you don't want to double count the revenue from the other segment that you already counted from a systems perspective. Um, other than that, this is all basically complete and we'll be publishing it soon. Questions on this so far? Okay, this is important because of the trends that these are driving, and we saw a lot of this at supercomputing. There, there, there's a lot of overlap back and forth between HPC and hyperscale. They're different markets, but they're influencing each other a great deal, starting with on the software side with, uh, with OpenStack. Uh, we see OpenStack getting deployed in certain HPC types of installations. Square kilometer array is a great example of a, of a classic HPC installation that's using OpenStack. And that's going to potentially influence other software kinds of initiatives. Um, it, you know, does, does OpenStack have any influence on OpenHPC as an example? You know, is that going to work its way into any of the Intel stack? Uh, you, we, we had presentations this week on the confluence of, of big data and, and HPC. So uh, at the software layer, at the middleware layer, I think you are going to see influence going back and forth. Hyperscale is also driving new application areas, particularly in this whole artificial intelligence area. My favorite one from the last couple of weeks was AlphaGo. Uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Google program, artificial intelligence program that was uh, that that beat the the I don't know what do you call a Go grandmaster. The, he had his nine whatever ranking, but he beat the world champion of Go. He the Google program, the the non gender specific Go program beat the uh, reigning world champion at Go, and it was kind of another great example of of uh, artificial intelligence. This is important because it's a mach it's, it's, it fits the characteristics of a high-performance computing application, but it's being done within a hyperscale infrastructure. If we were being really picky about it, we would try to break that out and move it back into HPC, but it's kind of hard to count a segment of the hyperscale infrastructure and move it back into HPC. I think it's easier to say, here's the hyperscale market, and sometimes it runs an application that really has HPC-like qualities, and that's going to be the machine learning space. It's very difficult to count machine learning as an HPC application, unless you can segment out how much money Google and Baidu are actually spending on specific HPC infrastructures without counting the whole thing. We know they are. I mean, a part of their, their system will be based on InfiniBand and GPUs and things like that. But, it, but it's only a small portion of the overall infrastructure. It's big if you're NVIDIA. It's small compared to the rest of hyperscale. Um, competing standards in this part of the market are, are going to be a big deal. Look at you know, Open Compute Project. It's talked about, I think, the most. Um, but we know that Open Power has a significant influence here. Um, and uh, Open Compute Project is driven by the American um, uh, hyperscale companies, uh, primarily associated with Facebook, although Google just joined at the platinum level at the OCP Summit two weeks ago. Uh, but in China, it's, it's different ones. Um, uh, Baidu is really 
the uh, primary force, the progenitor of a standard called Beji or Scorpio. Uh, and it's similar to Open Compute Project, except that it's all different standards. This has changed how server vendors have to compete in this space, right down to, I was blown away that they, they have a different definition of what a rack unit is. Right, like I didn't, it just had never occurred to me. A U is a U, right? If you say something is four U tall, that, that means something to me. It's like it's this big. And, and then I'm, I'm at this Beji meeting at Baidu, and they're talking about these 54 U racks. And I'm like, well, how can you have a 54 U rack? It's not going to fit, you can't ship it anywhere. They said, no, no, the U is smaller, right? What do you mean the U is smaller? You can't do that. No, but they have, right? So, and OCP has a different definition of a U. Beji and Scorpio have a different definition of U. And they're on their second different definition of U. They actually changed what it was from V2 to V3. So it's this kind of thing where if you're now on the server side and you're selling into this space, it's, it's different multiple SKUs that you have to maintain. It's all different form factors that you have to maintain. The ODMs are coming into this space hard. It's not just the traditional server vendors selling into this space. It's Quanta and, and JBill and WeWin uh, because I can, I can bring them something and say, you know, this conforms to open power. It's open license. It's, it's an OCP thing. And, and I know you make intelligent vending machines, but can you build me 5,000 racks of this? And sure, they'll just go do it, right? Heck, they'll probably be 3D printing it in a couple of years. Um, so that is going to have a major influence on the, on the market because that much volume, you can set the market and say, I want this configuration and you'll get it. Uh, and then finally, the deployment of, of high performance technologies for selected applications, as I was mentioning, the GPUs and InfiniBand and things like that that are going into, especially some of those uh, machine learning kinds of areas. Okay, uh, then the final point, because I'm out of time, uh, but accelerated computing was a major trend, and I don't need to cover this too much because NVIDIA mentioned this report already, but we did go through our site census and count of the 50 top HPC applications that people used, how many are already optimized, at least at some level, for GPUs. And it was nine out of the top 10, and it's two-thirds of the top 50. So we're seeing a lot of momentum there in accelerated computing. This is an area where Intel is going to need to catch up with Xeon Phi, and we are seeing a lot of interest in all of these different processor architectures. We've actually done a whole multi-client study on this to look at how users are evaluating all the different processor technologies in the market. Um, it's just as well that I'm out of time because I'm not going to give any details on the results from this study because none of you have paid for it. But it's really great uh, data and we can forecast now how much of the market do we think will go to open power or how much will go to ARM or Xeon Phi or even things like OmniPath versus InfiniBand which get entangled in a lot of the processor choices. The one thing I will say is that it's clear that HPC is moving toward a future where end users are going to be grappling with multiple architectures. We've really moved away from standards and keeping everything the same back toward an, area of, an era of specialization where people will start matching application workloads to particular architectures. 70% of HPC respondents in the study said that they think they'll be maintaining multiple architectures into the future. And, and that's very different from where we've been in the Beowulf era of, of standards and portability. We're now moving back away from that. And that's going to be a challenge for end users, but I think it's the world that, that we're going to be in and has everything to do with things like uh, programming languages and models like we were talking about on the, on the panel yesterday on the path to exascale. Okay, that's the end of my time. Uh, do I have time for questions, Sydney, or not? A couple. Okay. Yes. We can throw it to you. So, uh, from the system side perspective, so from the system management tools, monitoring tools, how do you see, like, potential convergence between HPC and hyperscale on, on this side because there's a lot more 
workforce developing this stuff on the hyperscale side? Right. So in the middleware layer management tools, how to, uh, what's the overlap between HPC and influence between HPC and hyperscale? There is some. Um, you know, we were talking a lot yesterday about containers, and that's been one area that, that's developed primarily in enterprise and, and hyperscale that's gradually working its way over into HPC, this notion of a, of a virtualized container. Um, I, I think the HPC market wouldn't have been ready for that before this year, and now we are seeing uh, seeing that migrate over. Um, there was another one I was going to mention, and then I, while I was talking about containers, it fled my mind. Uh, hopefully, it'll come back to me while I take another question. Yes. Programming languages, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Programming languages, uh, I think, is a, another big er area that, that uh, hyperscale uh, will have an influence. The, the HPC market, for as long as we've been surveying it, and I suspect longer than that, it changes a little bit year to year, but the easiest way to think of it is that it's been 25% C, 25% C++, 25% Fortran, and 25% everything else. And the thing that's changed year to year is what's in the everything else. And as something will grow in the everything else category, they'll talk about replacing C and replacing Fortran. And that doesn't happen. The only thing that changes is the mix of what's in the everything else bucket. We haven't seen a big push to replace C with or Fortran with Java or, or Python or, or things like that. I mean, we do see Java and Python, but, but only in that everything else. And it hasn't changed the other 75% of the market. I'm starting to wonder whether a programming language like Go from the hyperscale side could come over into HPC in a meaningful way because they're designed for parallelism at a new level. And that would be a different player. Now, this is kind of on the way out there because Go is right now used by only a couple of Google wonks, right? Uh, but, but I could see it happening. In the long run, if that really got going, or if it's not Go, then something else that's like it for, for parallel computing at extreme scale, that really could move over from the hyperscale market into HPC in the long run. I, has anyone here looked at Go at all? I'm kind of curious about it. Or really raise your hand so I can see it. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so here, <laughs> that actually makes me feel better about that kind of thing. How is it? Anybody? Like thumbs up, thumbs down? So, so? Nicer than C? Nicer than C. Okay, so there's my point. I, I think something like Go could eventually come over into HPC because it has those parallelism aspects. Did that answer your question, or were you looking for something else? Oh, yeah. Uh, second part, just open source versus proprietary compilers. Open source versus proprietary compilers. Um, that, that line gets fuzzy because certain companies are starting to play fast and loose with the word open, <laughs> right? There are, there are different degrees of openness in things now. Um, in particular, in the open HPC stack, I'm not sure how open a lot of those things are. Um, they're open in that I think anyone can contribute to them, but, uh, but then the ownership of them becomes a little different. Um, in the long run, I think in as much as most software has been trending away from proprietary toward open source, compilers have been going the other direction. And I would need to check my data to be sure on that, but that's because of the proprietary nature of the underlying architectures that the, the technology companies behind them have a vested interest in making sure that you have optimized codes. So, you know, it gets even something like CUDA. Is that open or not? I, I'm seriously asking. Would you count CUDA as being open? Right. Well, okay. So, I, th I think they will be free, and I think that many of them will be open source, but I think they'll be highly proprietary to the architectures that they're tied to is maybe the best answer to the question. Yes. An interesting comment about CUDA and open. 
So Google has recently developed and released uh, CUDA support in Clang. So right now you can use an open source compiler to compile CUDA applications. And it's better and faster than NVIDIA's compiler. Okay, you're hired as an analyst. <laughs> <laughs> yes? The future of Ceph in HPC? Well, I'll lump Ceph in with almost the whole parallel file system space for a second, because for years I was on about the untapped potential of parallel file system adoption in commercial markets, which even today is lagged far behind what it technically ought to be, with things like big data really taking off. Yeah, I see this huge market potential for commercial inst institutions to adopt parallel file systems. The incidence of that is quite low. I think it's still 14%. I'd have to check my numbers. But it's 14% plus or minus of high-performance computing commercial is using some kind of parallel file system that's mostly relegated to the really big ones like in oil and gas. Um, so, you know, for years I was saying, well, really, there are, there's this big void. You ought to see something like, well, PNFS was kind of the first one. I thought, PNFS, that'll go, right? And then that never really happened. I thought, well, all right, well, so the next one was Ceph, because Red Hat bought Ink Tank. So Ceph ought to really be integrated into Red Hat and populate through the uh, enterprise. And then that didn't really happen. So then I'm thinking, well, the next thing that should happen is Amazon should do it. Amazon should buy any S3 compliant parallel file system that people like. You know, pick one. Orange FS would be a perfectly nice choice. Rebrand it as the Amazon file system and push it out to the market so that you'd have an S3 ready storage device across the enterprise. But Amazon shows no appetite for that. They're not going to do that. So what's next? And it keeps kicking further down the road. And my new thought on this, really, in the last couple months, is I think enterprise is going to skip parallel file systems. I think enterprise, aside from a couple of pockets, just is never really going to get there. And what will happen is they'll skip parallel file systems and go directly to object. And, and you'll, you'll abstract out of the whole file system thinking. Now, there might be something parallel that's embedded underneath it. But I think what's really going to happen over the next five years is that there will be a big push toward object orientation in enterprise storage. And you won't see, I mean, there will be more. It'll grow from 14%, but it's not going to get to 60. But by the time you ever got anywhere close to that, object will have taken over. And that's just an opinion. I don't know. I could wind up being wrong. I've been wrong about parallel file system adoption in this space all along because I thought it would happen, and it didn't. Okay, we're done. Thank you very much, everybody.